I am Amanda Washington. I am the National New Play Network producer in residency at Actors Express and welcome to Raising the Curtain Colors in, of the Industry. So Raising the Curtain is all about last summer, a lot of theaters said we're going to take a step towards diversity, equity and inclusion and making those spaces more open and accessible to everyone, regardless of any form of label that may that they may have. And so Raising the Curtain is Actors Express's um, open diary, if you will, to that promise. And Colors of the Industry is specifically talking about how design varies from anything and everything. And so how do you design for different cultures, but also specifically learning about how you design for those different cultures. And so that is why we are here tonight. Do you all wanna introduce yourselves, panelists? Sure. Uh, my name is Jeremiah Davison, and I am a founding member of Multi Band Studios and the vice president, and a sound designer, a sound engineer, and also a director and producer. That's it. Awesome. My name is Pamela Rodriguez Montero. I am a sonographer, a visual artist, and an assistant professor of costume design. I am from Costa Rica, and I teach at Kennesaw State University. I teach costume design there. Hello, my name is Casey Willis. I am a theatrical sound designer turned podcaster by way of the pandemic. Um, I am the founding producer of Could Be Pretty Cool, which is a production company that started off as a live event uh, company. We had one event January of 2020, and now we are a podcast production company. So life is fun. Yes, like shaping and morphing for your circumstances. I, I guess that kind of leads me to my first question. How did you all, okay, in the briefest of terms, because I know us theater people can talk forever. How did you all get into design? I feel as if design is one of those areas like directing. It's not really talked about in high school. You just know it somehow happens and how you actually get into it is an entire mystery like Nancy Drew itself. <laughs> I laugh at that because it's true. Like, um, I'm gonna jump in, but um, I'm from Costa Rica. I grew up in Costa Rica, went to high school, uh, did my bachelor's over there. So with, I did not have a lot of exposure to design with the theater in general. I did not have a lot of exposure. I did not really think I wanted to do a theater person because if you ask me, like, do you want to do theater? I would picture me on a stage and I'd be like, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I still don't, but um, I, I, I really knew since the first, like since I was little that I wanted to create, that I was very attracted to visual arts. So my background is actually visual arts. I did um, my bachelor's degree in arts and visual communication with an emphasis in printmaking. And by, you know, coincidental reasons, I started working in a children's museum who also had an auditorium that they were rent for events and like things. And I uh, became an assistant there and I was like, oh, look what they're doing with these lights and what they're doing with the sets. And like, oh, this is a thing. Oh, wow, this is a thing. And then after that, I, I knew I wanted to explore more. So I went to grad school for um, sonography and I gave myself the opportunity to explore the three areas before I committed to one more specifically or before I even said like, oh, I'm gonna focus on this. So to me, it's kind of like through the back door, but uh, rooted in visual arts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Rooted in visual arts. Casey or Jeremiah? <laughs> I feel like my story is almost identical. Just replace all of the visual references with music. Um, started off playing music, high school and college, um, marching band, jazz band, orchestra. And 
eventually wandered into the theater um, in undergrad. And one of the professors was like, yeah, we don't have anyone who's interested in doing sound design. Is that something you might be interested in? And I didn't know. So I just kind of started pressing buttons and they told me bring in some sound effects for this showcase we're gonna do. And I was like, ooh, okay. And that was kind of like the first, like I did not know this was a profession moment. And similar to uh, Pamela after undergrad, um, did a master's in sound design at Savannah College of Art and Design and uh, have sort of been dipping my toe in all sorts of uh, theatrical work, digital work uh, ever since. Yeah, I would say mine, of course, is similar. Um, uh, with me, I started <laughs> off in uh, at Georgia State Perimeter College uh, and uh, was there uh, and just, I was wanting to be an actor, you know, as all we all usually want to be starting off in theater and wanting to be an actor, director, I'm like, okay, okay, how can I do this? But then they started showing me like the behind the scenes and I started helping out, uh, you know, whether it's just being a um, stage runner or something of that nature, operator, board operator, and just learning those skills um, in class helped me. So when I went to uh, my next college was Georgia, uh, I was like, oh, I want to do lighting design. I want to just try it. Why not? I was one of those people that just wanted to learn everything and, and um, you know, have learn what it is to be in the theater. Because I knew ultimately one day I had this big dream. Oh, I'm going to run a theater. So, uh, yeah, that all led me to just have these skills and knowledge that I didn't have. So when I got to Actors Express as an intern uh, in 17, 2017, uh, Color Purple was happening and they were like, hey, uh, we would like for you to engineer it. Uh, your resume seems as though you can. And I'm like, uh, okay, that's a big show to just be engineering for the first time, but okay. And I did it and it turned out fine. Uh, and it just turned out that that was a love that I didn't know I had. And again, then the next year I met Chris Lane, who is uh, my business partner with uh, Monty Band. And from there, we just kicked it off. Um, started with an actor room. And again, Seamus at Actors Express came to me and said, hey, have you ever thought about sound design? And I was like, no. And he was like, well, you're pretty good at it. You, you, you pick up to it. You should think about it. And so I did. And Actors Express was actually the first ones to give me my full-fledged opportunity uh, with Head Over Heels. So it's been one of those journeys where I, I just kind of like, fell into it, but also fell in love with it at the same time. And then also seeing that it's a, it's a way to create a pathway for others um, that didn't know that this was a thing, just like myself. All right, okay, cool. Education seems like it's the biggest thing, but more so education in not necessarily a school structure, but more in the actual real world type of thing. Is that what I'm hearing from all of you all? Or I think for me, it's the experimentation, um, just kind of like mm -hmm. finding something that you are attracted. Like, you know, I, I was a little bit like when I was in the studio, like doing my art, I would be like, yeah, this is great. I love it. But it kind of gets lonely and I would like to connect a little bit more and build a community. I didn't really knew how theater was produced or done. So until I was like, oh, hmm. I see there's still like people who do arts, like they have to render and draw and paint and like design with these lights and like do these settings. And I knew like, I know sets get built and like things get paint, but I never really connected it. So once I was like, oh, okay, I, I could do these. I could use all the skills that I've been building in this formal setting. And I could still have, you know, my uh, moment to do studio art and like paint and work and imagine but apply to something that builds community and that I will be collaborating with other people and that will be uh, telling a story collectively. Because that was like, to me, the missing piece to uh, visual arts, just studio visual arts. I was like, well, you know, I feel like I want to collaborate. I want to connect with other humans. And right now, just me by my stu in my studio is great sometimes, but some other times I want to have like this, let's do something, let's create, or like back and forth of ideas. Um, 
And then, yeah, when I took it to a formal setting and I actually did my MFA, then that's just when I started more structured, like exploring each area and like saying, oh, okay, this is what each area has to explore. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, okay, with the, the education setting and the structure, how did you all go about learning the different ways to design for different cultures? Because no one play is built the same. No one world for a play is built the same. So how did you all navigate? So um, Pamela, you're from Costa Rica, like designing for the African-American world or Jeremiah, you designing for the Costa Rican world. Like how, did, how does this all, how did you all learn this knowledge? Like somebody tell me. <laughs> Uh, I would say research. Uh, <laughs> yeah, research. Um, that's what I was like. It was noted in uh, my head uh, at school. Do your research. Do your research. And so um, I don't know if you know Alan Young. He will always say, always say do your research, girl. And he was a, um, a costume designer. But he, he um, they nailed that into our head. And when you do your research, not only just like going on Google, looking up, but also reading books calling people, asking people questions. So if I am doing a play on Costa Rica and I know Pamela, I'm calling Pamela and I'm, I'm literally going to dive all into her brain to see what she knows. Um, that's one of the things and yeah. I would say the same and also like an awareness of who I am, what am I bringing, mm -hmm. what am I doing, in which I'm seeing things. Cause you know, it's even if I would represent my own people from my own country or a play that is happening in my own country, I have to know that my experience might be just completely different to someone who is just even in my own household just because of our identities and how we are, you know, composed. So I feel like just understanding the lens in which I'm seeing the, the phenomenon, the culture, the event that I'm trying to portray. And as Jeremiah was saying, like just do it through research, like go through your primary sources as much as you can and like go through like the different things and don't just settle for like one finding that you do, but question it and keep like looking and keep that hunger of like, oh, what if I go somewhere else to another source and I find something different? And what if I have two different things? How do I mix them or connect them? So um, it's kind of like that's to me the most, the most fun part for research is questioning, going back and forth, questioning my own lens, mm -hmm. and then yeah. rekindle that research. Um, I think a lot of my perspective as a designer actually stemmed from my undergrad experience. Um, I went to an HBCU, um, Hampton University. And so in a way, diversity was always the default, if that makes sense. Like if we did Greece, inevitably the cast would be all black. So it wasn't like, uh, okay, well, we have to change the script in order to fit the culture of the, it was, we're going to do the play Greece. This is what the play is about. This is who the characters are. These just happen to be the actors and the designers we have in the space to tell this story. And so, I think for me having those as like my formative, like theatrical experiences coming out into the real world, a lot of that, even though it's, it's kind of strange because it was almost like the opposite in terms of diversity being the default, but really trying to keep in mind that in the space, like these performers, these designers, we are all here to create the world of the play, regardless of you know who we are. And I know that in this sort of present moment that we're in, folks are having to really dissect what that does to an industry, which is fascinating. Um, but it's, it's something that I think I, I never even, really thought about until honestly last year you know how does the the individual uh, cultural backgrounds of a design team affect the way the show is going to flow how would this show have been if the designers had been from different places than what they're you know where they're from um i think these are really interesting questions that we're just now starting to ask as an industry yeah, I was going to ask, ask you. Oh, wait, Pamela, are you going to say something? No, no, I was just like absolutely 100% uh, agreeing with Casey and like yeah. about how yeah. interesting that experience is. 
Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, like, how do you all go about navigating those conversations? Like, I know a lot of it's always on the director and me as like a director. That's really that's really all I want to do and all I truly know how to do. (laughs) Like other than for some reason, the director is just not there. (laughs) How do you all go about having those conversations when it's like different people at the table and then finding that one vision? Like I said, I know a lot of that's the director, but pretend I'm not. (laughs) I feel like for me, I am always in like the translator mode. You know, I, I navigate this in my current life in a language that is not my first language. So I am constantly like re-seeing things. And like this experience um, of coming to another country, you know, even becoming like racialized and understanding different, like what is this place? What is this um, different dynamics that I'm not used to? Uh, has allowed me to like stop connections and like trying to like make a bridge between like what is the designer trying to the director trying to tell me and what I'm seeing as a designer um I think conversations and sketches to me sketches are very important to like have a point of connection like to make this translation like okay this is what I'm trying to say do you see the same that I'm trying to tell you here um are these colors something good um then the text as well when we're like going off by a text the text is like this common link that, you know, we both have. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Casey, I feel as if you were about to jump in. I know, I wasn't like, is Casey going to say Oh, we, oh no, it wasn't really. <laughs> um, I think, um, fortunately, with most experiences that I've had with directors, they've done a, a really good job of making sure that the the intention of the narrative was clear for all the designers. So once that has sort of been established, for me, it's really a matter of figuring out what not to take personally. Um, Something that happens a lot or did happen a lot is, you know, I would bring a particular song choice for maybe like a scene transition or even curtain call. And the director would be like, you know, I don't I don't think that's how I want to end it. Or I I think that that's too slow. I want to move the pace forward. And it could be a song that like I personally, as a designer, feel very strongly about, and this is what I think we, but if that's not what's going to support the overall narrative, and, you know, it took time, of course, you take it personally in the beginning, but eventually just learning what to sort of let go, it's, even though your design is your baby, like, you have to give your baby over to the rest of the village to make the village run, and so that's kind of how I've had to let go of a lot of of a lot of choices that are are not mine to make because it's not my show. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Famela and Casey, you're spot on. I mean, it, it's collaboration. It, it is within that. Uh, some of the things I tried to do uh, because earlier, you know, starting out, it was like, okay, I would get there, and of course, they would they would uh, hear it and they would say, oh, that's not it. And I'm like, dang, okay, I got to figure this out. But what I tried to do to hinder that and at least help uh, ahead of time is just being prepared, more prepared. So beforehand, trying to like have some sounds for them to hear, even if it's separate meetings. Uh, I know particularly on the last show I did, we definitely met a lot beforehand just to make sure the sounds were right because it was a heavy transition So, So, It's just one of those things of like, and if the director doesn't know, and they're just like, I've had directors just go, I don't know, Uh, you know, I I don't know. And I know, I know. And I'm like, (sighs) okay. And that's when I just have to figure it out. I usually say figure the F out. That's usually what I say in my mind. Just like, I gotta, I gotta figure out what to do. And I bring them options and at the end of the day, it'll be fine. I I just want you all to know. As we go forward, Freddie is okay with cursing. So if you want to say okay, figure cool, it the fuck cool. out, figure it the fuck out. <laughs> Thank you. You know who was watching. <laughs> We're all good. Yeah. But I think that Jeremiah said about options. I think that's very important. It's a key. Uh, just having options and doing the research. We finished a show. We just opened a show together. And that it was a beautiful process with a lot of research, a lot of back and forth and like digging in through period stuff and um options and options are a great a great thing to start conversations to like even contrast ideas i do feel also um 
to feed in off of the collaborators, not only the director, but like maybe just having meetings in which you are like having another designer that it might not be the thing you're discussing, but it might bring something mm. else or like a director who can absorb different designers perspectives. And when they meet like with the sound designer, they might reference something that the costume designer, the set designer would say, or just meeting all together. I found like this big, big meetings with like all designers and directors and like just throwing ideas. These creative gems are great for, for you know, so, finding that unity. Mm-hmm, find the unit. Find the unity. That's a great segue. You've done all the research. The unity is there. It's speaking to the piece. It's on fire. However, it's not what the director wants all of a sudden. What do these directors do with themselves? Um, and, <laughs> and they ask you for something that's not necessarily um, accurate to either the time period, the culture, whatever the circumstances may be. How do you go about navigating that? Like, what are we doing? Are we saying, are we, are we saying don't do it to the director? That's always a scary conversation. I think when you, the research back, the research backs you up and like if you are able to show that that's not an appropriate way to approach a subject or a culture or even like maybe not conducive to the story, I think you you got at some point say like I don't think this is uh, respectfully and I think this is a good choice. Look at this research or that perspective. I um, feel like you know I hope we're moving into a more collaborative spaces in which our voices, you know, while the director is like gathering all the voices and kind of weaving them through, they we're still part, like our voice is our voice. And so I hope we are like moving more to that because I feel like if you have the research and you have how to support your ideas, you at some point have to pick the battle. And if that one is a good one, you have to pick it and go. Yeah, yeah I would almost say, even though we've all sort of been discussing the director as like the end all be all like decision maker. Also having a good director who is willing to listen to suggestions from their team is paramount. Um, I know a specific example, um, I'll shout out Ellen McQueen, who I worked on a show uh, that she directed called Woke with the Essential Theater. And speaking of a, a curtain call song, um, I have picked a curtain call song. And it was actually one of the actors who spoke to her and said, you know, I just, I don't think the show should end this way. Can you have a conversation with the sound designer about it? And she spoke to me like, you know, we were thinking, you know, maybe instead of having an end on this note, we have an end on this note. And it's just, when you have respectful people in the room who again are trying to serve the best story it shouldn't be a, a fearful conversation from anyone from an actor from a designer from an intern from from anyone to be able to say i just have this this one little suggestion or this one little thing that's bothering me and the director doesn't necessarily have to say you know okay whatever you said we'll do it but the more that everyone is sort of uh, operating with we're all again here for this story we want to tell the best story having these conversations especially moving past everything we've all just gone through should not be a scary thing they should be a welcome thing i would hope uh for any organization individual um moving forward You, you ain't got nothing it. to add. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it's that. I, I, what would I do? I, pretty much the same thing. And it's just uh, finding that uh, balance of just being able to say, hey, can we talk about this? And like for me, let's say, bring in the research. Hey, uh, you know me, I, I'll always have a backup. So, hey, okay, this is not it, but this is similar. It may be somewhere near, you know, compromising. It may be somewhere near what you want, but it, we do need to get kind of in this uh, space and world. And it's what uh, we are getting into a space. I think that everyone is starting to, the directors are starting to think about the room and not only director, other co-designers too. We have to hold not just the directors uh, accountable, but also other designers who may, as they're collaborating, are not doing as much research as well that may support what you're doing. So, you know, it's, it's those things, but they pretty much say, that's it. So is this where you see the industry headed more collaboration on, like we already say theater's collaborative, 
But honestly, if you're an outsider as a non-theater person, what does that even mean? But also, the industry is just changing right now. I think we're in a great time to be an artist. Like, mm -hmm. I feel as if it's a great time to be an artist. So where, do, where exactly do you see it headed? I, I see us heading into a beautiful place. Uh, I, I see us going somewhere that I just see the inclusion, the diversity happening. My biggest fear, as all of our biggest fears, is that uh, the diversity and inclusion happens, and then we get to a point where there is it stops. You know, and we've we've gotten we've that's that seems to be have been a trend sometimes in Atlanta theater in a lot of ways. Um, and I mean, the having that hall meeting that we had last year. Uh, during the pandemic time, the meeting where they just, everyone talked, um, people of color got, BIPOC artists got to talk out and say what they felt was great. I think it was just opportunity for theaters to listen, to see what they can do better. And not just for us, but, you know, for other, all the whole community and how can we be better as audience members? You know what I mean? So I think we're going into a better space. I think we just have to continue to support one another, continue to bring the younger ones up and uh, continue to create educational pipelines um, that will establish a more diverse uh, space. Thank you, Jeremiah. That's that's it. I would say, like you know, the points of collaboration and education are so important. You know, it's just only Amanda, you and I in the classroom, like a sh sharing and like nurturing future students as well. Mm -hmm. And like saying, you know, voices are important, like saying your voice, seeing your representation and pushing for that in our own institutions is also important. Yeah. Crap, there was a there was a question was there and then it left me. <laughs> oh no. But education pipelines, yes, mentorship. You all um it wasn't necessarily in your direct school pathways where you got into design. How do you think that should in some ways be changed or are, are we okay with the stumbling upon it in the children's museums? <laughs> <laughs> I feel personally feel like I want I want it to be a more clear choice for um for you know young people who are are attracted to creating and are attracted to making and they want to like explore other possibilities. So I do, you know, I, I say it to people who are like, well, you know, I want to paint, draw and like, well, you can also design, like this is also a career. So I feel like it's important to just put it out there and like this that you're doing, for example, like showcasing what a designer does and what the process is. And like, I would get mad at like this show Glee when I only watched like one episode because people were talking about it and I was like, well, you know, where are the light hair and where are the costume fittings? Then nothing is the happening here. It's just like everything flies and like suddenly there's lights and sound and everything. So I feel like, you know, even if the show in the backstage a little bit more, it's important to, to show that that's a possibility. I think that even though we all are cringing every time we get a request for another Zoom meeting in our lives, I don't think that Digital is going away as far as connecting people and audiences to theater, um, whether or not that's like full scale productions or even some of the ways that Actors Express has been innovative with, you know, audio stories and podcasting and, you know, virtual showcases. I, I feel like in some form or fashion that is going to become a heavier part of programming for a lot of places. And then to sort of, uh, I'm supposed to stop saying to piggyback off of, that's like one of the joke phrases of everything. But to piggyback off of what Jeremiah and Pamela both said, um, with education, I think that having access to theater for perhaps students who can't afford to go buy a ticket to a you know production and sit and see it live being able to see something on a screen or something on their smartphone could potentially be a way to at least drop that you know drop us uh, or start a spark drop a little bit of knowledge even if it was a virtual you know what Pamela said this is backstage y'all and hopefully one day you can come see it for real like I think that the sort of melding of these virtual and performing worlds 
isn't going to go away um, anytime soon, but hopefully that could potentially be an avenue to expose the world to people who may not have access to it otherwise. And Casey, you, you yes, familiar, yes. And uh, Casey, you said expose. I think that is the word, exposure. We need more exposure in the educational system, period. I mean, whether it is elementary from the time they're young, they should be exposed to these arts, uh, middle school, high school, and especially college, particularly college in Atlanta, colleges in Atlanta theater programs, I've seen have a lack of uh, exposure when it comes to design. Um, for example, we have a person on our team who had a, uh, who was into design, very into design and sound design particularly, and they are a sound designer, great sound designer, but they had to, they didn't have the necessary resources at their school because most of the, the program was centered around, of course, performance studies and uh, other things that weren't designed. So it's like they were that lone wolf, but luckily we had met them and we were able to help guide them to, you know, where they can, where they are today designing projects. But I think that's what we need, more just exposure uh, for these students because Huh. It, it, it's one of those touchy subjects for me where it's like, I, I just see it. And I was fortunate to go to a school, West Georgia. They they try their darndest to get you in design. It's more of a design school than it is performance, I say. And, but if more schools could be like that, and then, then it comes back to, okay, do they have designer teachers? Do they have people who are uh, mentors in those uh, facilities are, that are willing to take on um, these young designers and show them that there is a way. So, yeah, yeah, then, it is. It's a, yeah. yeah, and as Jeremiah was saying, sometimes I feel like, you know, Jeremiah took on like the mentorship. So maybe institutions could also establish those paths for mentorship outside, like what the professors can do with their, um, their space and you know just finding like connections with professionals and finding bringing professionals to the classroom and like sharing sharing what is the what is the process the opportunities giving contacts that's important i definitely think it's yes. important because i remember being in college i remember being in high school and i i knew somewhat of what design was how it actually got done was beyond my <laughs> educational experiences but then also once i actually got into grad school i actually was forced to actually get good grades in those design classes i was like where are the designers of color like i don't see anyone i was thinking about all the stage managers i know ever to start actually naming stage managers of color and then i was like okay what about a sound designer took me a while and this is before i met jeremiah it's before i heard about casey it's before i met famela and i've only known these people a couple of months like let's just let's just be honest so it's it's very important to have those pipelines and those mentorships and to hear about it in class and to bring people in do you all see your skills morphing during this pandemic like casey you got a podcast like, have, have you all had to step up and learn more so you can take it back into the classroom or take it back out into the industry? Like, tell me what's going on. Yes. Go, Casey. No, go, Casey. Go, Casey. Only thing, you know, so much of what you and Pamela were saying um, about exposure, even within the educational system, is just it's so true and it's kind of wild that it's still so true one of the best pieces of advice that i got as an undergrad was look at the credits of a film look at how many performers there are and then look at how many technical and design people there are where do you think you're most likely to succeed in working and for me that was kind of like oh there's lots of opportunity. Oh, okay, I get it. And so even from just like an economical standpoint, that's kind of what took me into the tech world. And that sort of mindset, to go back to your question, has been particularly uh, helpful during the past year and a half, because regardless of what your specific design discipline is, the principles can be applied to any 
genre, any, whether it's a film, whether it is a play, whether it is a podcast, whether it is a web series, whether it is, I mean, I don't, I, I got super into audio live streaming apps. Um, Spotify just put out theirs today. People are creating amazing content just talking on their iPhone. Like if you have the sort of design uh, acumen, design discipline, it can be applied to whatever you need to do to buy groceries and live indoors. So uh, yeah, that was a bit of a ramble, but yes. Um, <laughs> that was not a ramble at all. It was. No, yeah, that was I, true. Yeah. Yes, I do love Casey, what you say about like the flexibility of our skills. Like, you know, the research that we'll do, the research methods, the critical thinking, the decision making, that's something that you can translate among disciplines. And not to say I want to become a sound designer tomorrow, but I think the research oh. itself is there. The technical skills take more time to build up, but I love what you're saying about like being, being able to see that in big lines. Um, we share a lot of process, like our process is my be different in result, but they start off within the same, you know, analysis, critical thinking, research, gathering influences, gathering options, and then just playing them and verifying them and go back and forth. So I love that. I think it's beautiful that you say it. Um, I will go back to the previous question, <laughs> where do you see our industry going? But I do love that we hopefully can create a more interdisciplinary industry that we can like connect mm -hmm. with each other we can collaborate much more and like we can navigate those like collaborative processes in which we are creating together yes yes um you said sound expand it does not just sound but even in design like you were uh, both were saying it expands into so many things for example sound is everywhere i mean whether it's you learn sound design, but then you go into digital art or you learn uh, sound design. So you learn QLab, but guess what? Who, what also uses QLab? Projections So and, and video uh, media. So it's those things that uh, spark out. And um, yeah, it, it just helps you. I think sometimes we get caught into the sound design box and it's like, oh, you're supposed to learn just this and that's what you're going to do and be here at a theater for the rest of your life, one theater or one place. But you don't realize the expansion of like all the things of one thing. And so I think that's great. And to Amanda, your question, um, you asked, uh, has it like, have we had to, what did you say? You said, have we had to more yeah. changing your skills like learning more just during this time of like you're not just a sound designer but like casey's starting a podcast um you're also yes. a director like what more are you learning just than being in your field of design amanda um i so during the <laughs> pandemic uh i had um it was one of those things where i was in michigan i ended up in michigan back home and i didn't know what to do we were trying to figure it out we were like okay how can we help, what can we do? And uh, by the grace of God, I went and uh, found a, a church. Uh, I was just running and got caught and found a church. But basically with this church, I learned how to do virtual uh, church, uh, how to do virtual programming for church. So I have like uh, two churches uh, that virtually in Michigan and then three others that we can sought for. And so it's like it brought us into a whole new realm. And then digital marketing for nonprofits, that came out of nowhere. So it was like because of these set skills of learning, knowing just editing and computer sound, things like that, and all the different things you learn in stagecraft, we were able to take those things and uh, apply that and to help others, you know, because now we're helping their young people in their church learn skills that they may not have never learned. Uh, and this is in Flint, Michigan, that's where I'm from. So it's in a town that is like, you know, it's still poverty, it's still trying to figure out, but I mean, everybody good, but yeah. And I feel like to answer specifically, your question and connect a little bit with Jeremiah as well, for me has been the importance of like sharing uh, sketches now, how digital writing is moving, like, you know, has changes. I don't envision 
my in the future having production meetings of all of us in the same room and like having to bring my watercolor renderings to like for people to see in the same room i don't think that's ever going to happen again i think we're going to have production meetings that are zoom um they're more accessible and cheaper for everybody and you know allows more flexibility so just changing the mindset of how to share information, how to like have the importance of like now doing digital rendering. But as Jeremiah is saying, like for example, I use uh, I, an iPad and I use Procreate, but I can also do animation and like do videos and like time lapses. And that will connect me something that I'm like, oh, I could pivot from here to the other part, this other area. And it can happen. Um, so just be, being flexible and being able to, to explore other resources and say, oh, you know, Sharing digitally is a big thing now. It's a program shift a little bit to digital mm -hmm. rendering. I do miss that kind of Yes, I, I love that. Some I love hearing creative people thriving. I love hearing about creative people. You know, I I was a follower of sort of the starving artist mentality. You know, five six years ago, like just get me in the door. I will do anything for however much. But I think especially after last year, seeing what the world is like without, you know, having those particular spaces, live performing spaces and having to figure out, okay, how are, okay, how can we use these skill sets to continue to exist? Basically, I am team, get your bag, use what you got and, <laughs> and live. So just hearing both of your sort of stories is just like, yes, this is what we need to hear more of. So congratulations. And congratulations to you too. Mm -hmm. I was like, Casey, yes. you out here working too? Yeah, doing so, it. That kind of leaves me like, get your bag, resources. We're all growing. We're all glowing in this pandemic. Write that down. Chris has, <laughs> Chris <laughs> brought up a really good question. So going back to like, the resources, what I just mentioned. Schools should compensate professional artists to mentor and show certain students the professional world, especially if their program doesn't have any resources. He would love to know your thoughts on that. He knows my thoughts. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. We stand in the same. Yes. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent. Like I think it is true. Like asking, uh, especially asking an artist of color, a professional of color, to come talk to your class, and at least as an educator, like it has to be paid, um, recognized in some sort, a sort of form. Uh, but I also, you know, it just it comes from an understanding of the importance of that mentorship and what they are bringing. You know, like I feel mm -hmm. no institution won't ha will not have a gap. Like all the institutions have gaps in certain things so recognizing those and saying well you know we're allocating resources for that um to bridge the, the gap that we might find but it starts there like finding what are the gaps mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think uh, by doing oh go ahead go go ahead this conversation's about designers i'm clearly a director i'm gonna be quiet <laughs> I, I i think it's, it's an interesting well for hi chris Chris was on my podcast. I, I know Chris. Hi. Um, it's such an interesting thing tying back to some of the other uh, conversations we were having about education, whereas there are certain educational programs that don't even know what they're lacking because they don't even know what, you know, they aren't teaching students or what experiences or educational uh, uh, know how they're supposed to be teaching students. So it's, it's really tricky to, I, I think individual artists and creators should continue holding spaces like this, exactly what you're doing, Amanda, exactly what, uh, there's so many um, office hours uh, pop up things that have started to pop up where people are just like, hey, for four hours today, if you wanna come ask me questions about how, you know, how I got here, I'll help you. I think that, it's up to us as creators and as individuals to sort of recognize 
how fortunate we are to be working and thriving in this industry and to try to help as many others to do the same. And so if that is giving back in the formal educational setting, cool. I mean, like Pamela said, if they're compensating you to do that, like, yes, go, go talk to the kids. But also, you know, and it doesn't have to be all the time. It doesn't have to be something that's stressful or taxing, but if you get a random DM, like, hey, I was wondering, or, you know, if you get a random person who just kind of wants to pick your brain for a minute, gauging what, which types of situations are like consultations that people should pay for versus like, you know, just imparting some knowledge to someone, I think is very important for us as artists and creatives to make space for in our lives too. Yeah. So and mostly agree, yes. Yes, I love what Casey said. And like just reflecting back, you know, I go back and see like the many people who have helped me. Like I can go trace back like the many, 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 many people mm -hmm. who have lend a hand and advice a little bit of food whatever you know whatever could it be okay. you know all those things like just you know the path is different for everybody but just seeing people who have helped paying it forward paying it backwards like you know just just doing a little bit of that service as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes if you're not trying to do it if you're not if we're not doing it eventually for the next that's coming then why are we not, why are we doing it i mean mm -hmm. of course we're going to do it for ourselves to get the bag, get money. But at the end of the day, you have to educate the next because then the, the it, it drops and nothing. It's a line where it's just nothing. It's a blank space. Um, yeah. And I think with the resources, uh, just uh, for, for younger people realizing being able to have designers come in, being able to have mentors come in, helps them sh helps show them that you can be your own boss. You can be your own entrepreneur. You can do this no matter what. And you do not have to be a starving artist at all. You don't. I mean, it, you're going to struggle a little bit, yes. But at the end of the day, once the work comes, it's going to come. And we're in a space now, especially for artists of color, that it is su such a lack of um, diversity and a lack of us in the community that if we come on, the work is going to pile up to the point where it gets, it, it's so bad. Like I knew about Casey before Casey and I met, like, because they were, it was just like, they were like, hey, uh, sound designer, you know Casey, right? Because it's like, oh, y'all are like one of the three black sound designers or whatever it may be, right? So it's those things that if we do get into these systems more and they start hiring just to come talk to the class, you never know. Like we had a young lady went to talk to a Georgia State class and she ended up realizing through that class that she wanted to look into sound design. So she emailed us and, you know, it's, it's going from there. So, yeah. Mm. All right. Complete total subject change. What's you, what makes y'all say yes to a job? Like there's a lot of stories out here about, I can only speak to the African-American plight because I, that's, that I love being black and that's what I am. <laughs> but, um, um, oh, there's a lot of store, uh, a lot of theaters that are only interested in retelling trauma stories. And so when I get those asked about directing those things, I personally say no, but that's not all I consider when I'm saying yes or no to a job. What are some things that you all say yes or um, consider when you're saying yes or no, or maybe so to a job? At this point for me, I, are we speaking specifically theater jobs or? Please relate it to your podcast or however you were going to relate it. Sure. Well, thinking specifically about theater moving forward, I think I am slash will be only interested in new work. I think that there has historically sort of been this like, we have to put out our big blockbuster for the fall premiere and then we can do sort of the smaller straight play and we have our musical and then this new work that we're gonna do. And then we'll do our <laughs> closing seat. Like the new work traditionally hasn't been, you know, big sellers because it's new. You have to do a lot more to push people out to go see it. And I think one of the benefits, not 
this is one of the things that I hope will come from this time is that more sort of smaller or indie, you know, writers or productions, production companies are going to emerge. And I want to really help to support that type of work. Um, so moving forward with theater for me, new work is what I'm most interested in working on. And I um just listening to the new work and Amanda, what Amanda said about trauma, I love to explore joy, to explore stories that are like multi-dimensional that you see like they are like actually have layers and are telling me even if it's you know there's even if they're suffering in that story that i still know that they are redemption moments and they are like ups and downs and like it's not a linear like oh just blank one trauma one thing happening it's just joy and like you know stories that will make us see make us human you know my case with the latino community i love when i story like yes there are struggles but there are also joys and there are also moments in which you know we are absolutely in our best and shining and there are moments in which we are like struggling but like represent it all show it all in my mm -hmm. that's how i feel it I lost. sorry i'm just kidding uh <laughs> um yes um Exactly. The under, um, I like doing shows that are uh, related to the underrepresented. Um, mm -hmm. The communities, like Pamela was saying, that that are not uh, is represented, but also new works is a fun thing to do because you become those pioneers uh, in in helping that uh, story develop. And who knows where it can go? Um, and and who knows who in the future will read that and look at it and be like, oh, this is cool. You know, and I, I was always one of those people that liked to wanted to be in the dramaturg section of the Samuel French, but that's just <laughs> a, a personal thing. Uh, um, and also, I always look into artist collaborations. Like, who am I collaborating with? Um, mm -hmm. Just yeah. it, it's always artists around Atlanta that I'm like, okay, and it just around the world, it's like, oh yeah, I've always wanted to make that connection. I would love to work with them. And me as a um, aspiring director too, wanting to um, fully direct and, and start my own shows eventually. I like to work with directors that I know I could like really learn from as well. So that's a thing for me, uh, just being in the room um, and education opportunities, being able to take. Uh, Take, see shows that I'm like, okay, this would be a great fit for this person in our uh, in our on our team, because we tend to take people who are just shadows, or they might be an assistant, and then they learn, and then they eventually will lead their show. So, taking shows is uh, yeah, it can be a pipeline, another educational pipeline for others. I'm happy you said like working with different people in Atlanta because I definitely checked the email chain like whoever is cc like who cc'd on this like who am i getting to work with yeah <laughs> yes. yeah I know i'm not the only one who does that oh, yeah. it's very interesting you know because i'm sure it has happened to you but to me at least i have been like the only woman of color in the room for some teams the are uh, other teams you are like surrounded by people of color other teams you find like you know they're like half and half and like you're like okay this is a different dynamics so the team is very important, like what you are getting, the chemistry of the team, how much the production is like, you know, opening the spaces for all of us to get together and talk and like get to just meet each other and like have conversations and, you know, just create together. So that style of production is important as well. For me. Mm -hmm. um, final question. What's something that you all know now that you wish you knew back then? When, and when I say back then, back when you were we, we designers, didn't know that you would be as great as you are now. You didn't know that you would be a costume designer or a sound designer or a podcaster changing the world and the students at your fingertips. <laughs> I think for me, it's the importance of my own voice, um, the importance of my own style. Um, just to value that, to value how I see it, how I see things, and how I approach stuff. Because sometimes I would, I would spend like my first years trying to like you know fit into a box or a parameter of what I thought a designer would do, and like yet then feeling like okay, I don't fit. 
what what's wrong with me but in reality there's nothing it's just like that's my voice and it's different because of who i am so just embracing that part as well mm. you, you go ahead <laughs> uh, i guess i would say i wish that i knew that there was no such thing as waiting my turn. Um, now that that might be a hot take because of course we all had to pound the pavement. We all had to sort of, you know, come up in the game. But when it comes to your own creations, when it comes to the, the ideas that you have for yourself that, you know, one day I'm going to make this 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 stage play or one day i'm going to make this podcast you don't have to wait for anyone else to validate you and say now you're ready to do like do it whatever it is start it do it put it out there you do not have to wait your turn to create the things that you want to make so i think that mm. yes um yeah and mine is similar to that uh you uh, you belong in every room you're put into. Um, just remembering that and also to follow your instinct. Um, because uh, we, we f it's just one of those things where you fall into a thing where, okay, these people used to be my teachers. They used to be people I looked up to. But then you realize these are also your cohorts and it's time for you to shine too. And also I would tell myself to slow down. It's okay, because sometimes you get so caught in this, oh, I got to be here, got to do that, got to learn this, got to do that, got to do that. And you're missing the full vision of where you're really trying to go or the trajectory of where you're trying to go. Um, and you're missing it every time. But maybe it's just not meant that time. So I've also learned that. Mm. That's some good stuff. That's some good <laughs> Final thoughts. I think um, I would say for those looking at this and maybe thinking I want to start on this business or understand this, you gotta start for somewhere from somewhere. As Casey said, you are like you already have some tools. Reach out and like you know, just mistakes as mistakes and opportunities to learn and opportunities to grow and like just you know start where you are even if you're afraid and even if you're like don't really know to me start sketching and start drawing and start like thinking about stuff and don't don't wait until someone gives you that permission mm. Mm. here for it just, we don't need permission thank you for this this space to just chop it up with folks. Yeah. I think, I know for me, I'm having to like relearn how to socialize damn near. And so <laughs> it's just like, oh, talking to like art people about art stuff. Like, okay, this is, <laughs> this is going to take a minute, but it's so refreshing just to remember that like, we're not all just creating in our houses by ourselves all the time. There's like a bunch of us around doing stuff. So that's very invigorating. So thank you for this. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, all. Yeah, um, I, I second and third all of that. Um, just making sure that you, if this is what you want to do, and you don't know this one that you want to do, but you think it is, learn it, figure it out, ask questions, come to, different things of such like this, uh, raising the curtain, um, go on YouTube. The resources are all around us and we can learn it. Reach out to people on uh, Instagram, Facebook. You might think they they are bigger than what you, what they, you know, seem, but they're actually probably the nicest and uh, most helping person there is. And um, yeah, yeah, just re also remember to be yourself. Um, and also, I want to say shout out to Chris and Miss Inga. Uh, they have been going in on the chat. Yes, thank y'all for <laughs> keeping it lively. Well, hey, Freddie. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> all right, cool. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Like, this conversation has truly been thought provoking, and I shall definitely be writing some of these ideas. Well, not some, but be writing these ideas down to take to Actors Express so we can start incorporating them more into our everyday practices. Thank you, everybody who has been watching. 
make sure to join us next week for our final conversation of Raising the Curtain, which is whose story is it? Who gets to tell what stories, why, what not? We'll be having a deep, juicy conversation next week, Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, Actors Express also just announced their season today. Woot, woot. Go check it out on our Facebook. I don't know like if it's anywhere else other than Facebook, but for sure it's on our Facebook page. So go check that out. Corey, thank you so much for running the behind the scenes. And I think that is everything. Thank y'all again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you for your face. Bye.